Welcome to another episode of On the Bench with Beaks. This is episode 38. I am your humble host, Cody Beekman, and with me as always is Ross Mormeyer. Hey, how you guys doing? Daniel Beatty. Hello, everybody. And Bryce McMillan. Hey, guys, how's it going? Today we have such an incredible guest, all the way from Yotabori, Sweden, Marcus Philipson. Marcus, thank you so much for being on. Say hello to the lovely people out there. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure. Oh man, we're uh, we're gonna have a lot to talk about, bud, and I'm so excited to get into it. So let's uh, let's start it off with hockey day in history. And as per usual, we like the guests to do the honors. So Marcus, what do you have for hockey day in history? So on uh, November 27th, uh, I have in uh, 1999. The one and only Matt Sandin made his 400th point for uh, the Maple Leafs. Oh, that's a good one, and uh, you call you called it so well because I'm, I'm I'm sporting my Matt Sandin uh, hockey jersey today, obviously. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, I mean, Matt Sandin, what can you say about uh, such a, such an incredible leader for the Toronto Maple Leafs for so very long? He's it's such a shame that he never ever got to win a Stanley Cup. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I mean, he was a true leader both in the Maple Leafs and also in the on, on the Swedish national team. He played such an important role. And I mean, it's uh, in in my generation, it's players like him and uh, Forsberg, uh, Lidstrom that I mean, wonder that that's how we got into hockey in the first place and looking up to these guys. So, incredible player. So oh. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, um, it was, uh, I think it was back, uh, I think maybe um, the 2000s where uh, Tommy Sala led in that real uh, soft goal and like basically everybody was just uh, just blaming Sala for losing uh, the uh, the gold medal and Matt Sundin, like the true leader he was, just st- stepped up and said, no, this isn't just Tommy's fault. We could have played better in front of him. So that, that just, I think that speaks to uh, Sundin's real leadership. Yeah, for sure. And also on uh, the point of Solo, like uh, he did so many great things, but he will always be remembered for that one bad thing. Oh, yeah, you absolutely. remember when, uh, when Forsberg made his uh, penalty shot that he was uh, the one-handed penalty shot goal that he made? Then uh, he made the match-winning save afterwards, uh, Salu. But uh, people only remember the the mistake he made. Yeah, exactly. And well, that's kind of hard when, when you're a goaltender, man. That that's just like that huge weight that the you know tendies kind of pull uh, put on their shoulders, and it's just so, so unfortunate to see. Uh, so many people just breaking him down. Um, and that's a co- actually a callback to one of our very early episodes when we said top five attendees. Tommy Sala was in my top five. So um, big shout out to Tommy Sala as well as Matt Sundin. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, uh, Ross, what do you got for Hockey Day in History, bud? Well, uh, November 25th, 1998, we'll go with the Islanders goalie, Tommy Salo. <laughs> Yes, all right. And uh, <laughs> he stopped 44 shots, and Trevor Linden uh, recorded his 600th career NHL point in a 4-2 win against the visiting Flyers, which, I mean, I always loved Salo because, yeah, got to watch him with the Denver Grizzlies, and he won the Turner Cup here, as you guys know, and then he went to Utah and won back-to-back cups. So, I mean, I think he was probably one of my favorite Swedish goaltenders. But, yeah, I, I don't think he just ever did you know it never i guess came to fruition for him with the islanders and the teams that he had in the nhl so unfortunately what a weird time too because i was like oh great here's another hockey day in history related to the canucks in some way (laughs) you mentioned trevor linden and i was like oh wait no yeah he did play for the islanders for like a blip of time just like sundin with the canucks for a blip of time oh yeah all right, well, uh, Daniel? I got, a, I got a pretty good one. I think um, November 26, 1917, the NHL was born. Oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a so, pretty decent one yeah. right there. <laughs> uh, when five of the six owners of the NHA, the National Hockey Association, held a meeting at Toronto's Windsor Hotel, 
the Toronto Arenas, Montreal Wanderers, Montreal Canadiens, Ottawa Senators, and Quebec Bulldogs agreed to form a new league, the NHL. Right when their league got started. Yeah. And apparently the sole purpose of this agreement was for the owners to be rid of Eddie Livingstone and his NHA Toronto blue shirts. Yeah, actually, there was a uh, like. Apparently, Livingstone was just like this, you know, uh, like back alley dealer yeah. that uh, the entire association just could not stand. Total mm-hmm. greaseball. And the yeah, and the only reason why the NHL was formed was just to really like uh, stick it to him, stick it to the man. Which is somewhat ironic because an earlier hockey day in history I did was talking about like the dark days of the of all teams Toronto Maple Leafs with their shady owner who got sued for fraud. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anyway, you like the intrigue, don't you? I you do. Just like the dr- dramatics of uh, of the uh the league. All right, drama. Bryce, Bryce, what do you got there, bud? All right, so November 24th, 1995, Pittsburgh Tom Barrasso became the first gold center to record 150 victories as a member of the Penguins. So another gold tender for us right there. Um, but the milestone came in a 4-2 win against the visiting Dallas Stars. And guess who? Mario Lemieux led the scoring with two goals and an assist. Oh, geez. Yeah, Mario. Surprise. Getting, yeah, getting more points every single game. Super Mario le, le best. Le magnifique. <laughs> All right, let me uh, round this baby off real quick. Uh, November 25th, 1989, Luke Robitaille scored his sixth hat trick in the Kings' 7-4 win over Vancouver at the Forum. There it is. Boom. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> at the Forum. Uh, tie, it, tie it all up real nice in a bow. All right, so anyways, we have such an awesome guest here today, uh, Marcus Phillips, and he is the co- the host and producer of his own podcast, Sports pa- Sports management podcast if i could talk today i I really like to start being able to do that (laughs) anyways uh uh marcus uh him and i we uh we met over um over the internet talking about uh, podcasts and he's been doing some great work for us and he's been doing some great work for his own podcast it's a new up-and-coming podcast so uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that chat some hockey and let's get into it. So, um, Marcus, uh, let's take it all the way back to when you were a kid. Um, you know, uh, what's your background like? How'd you get into sports? How'd you get into hockey? Um, maybe just give us a little idea of uh, what what uh, where uh, Marcus Phillipson came from. Yeah, sure. So, uh, born and raised in Sweden, and uh, grew up in uh, Göteborg, Gothenburg, as you said earlier. It's the second biggest, uh, second biggest city in, in Sweden after Stockholm. And uh, I grew up, played many sports, uh, soccer, hockey, uh, floorball, among some other things. But hockey was always my sport. That was the one that I that loved. Started playing around six years old in a, a team called uh, Kollered, uh, which is um, 10 minutes uh, south of Gothenburg. So I was playing there for 11 years, never uh, Never on any competitive level, so to speak, but uh, always loved the game, always uh, loved to play. Stopped playing when I was around 17, uh, started uh, some uh, coaching, uh, some refereeing. And uh, then in 2013, I, uh, I moved to Greece since my, uh, with my family. For my, my dad was uh, working over there and uh, I followed to uh, pursue my sports management studies. And uh, yeah, so just uh, spending time there with my uh, with my uh, friends from school, and I uh, mentioned that I uh, that I played hockey and that I love hockey, and they uh, didn't expect anything to I mean exist in Greece, but uh, they said that uh, ah, I think there is an ice rink open like around Christmas time. We can go and just skate, you know, have some fun. So went there, saw some pictures of a local team, and uh, sent them an email and. Uh, uh, they invited me to come play, so uh, it's it's more of a more of a beer league over there, and uh, I played with a team called uh, Iptameni, which translates to Flyers, so Athens Flyers, and uh, we are playing on, I mean, what we got there. They they used to have some some ice rinks back in the days. Now we're there is basically just oh. one, which is uh, more or less half of a standard size rink. Possible. But uh, the guys there just love to play. They, I mean the the community to 
spend time together, spend time together, play hockey that we love. So every every Friday night we are uh, going there, playing for two hours, and then going for some food and beer afterwards. So that's uh, yeah, that was not what I expected when I when I moved to Greece to find hockey there. But uh, probably, I mean, hockey could be found almost everywhere, which is pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely, and um, uh, that's that's a big thing that we like to uh, we kind of like to promote is that you know hockey actually really does travel well. And um, uh, we had just talked to a gal that uh, played pro in Australia, if you can believe it. So um, uh, let's 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 start with this. Um, uh, I mean, correlation to um, Swedish hockey and Greece hockey. I mean, like you told, I mean, in, in Sweden, it's it, I, it's probably one of the bigger sports. And then you move to Greece, and yeah, you say it's like beer league over there. Um, uh, I, how hard was it to find it? I mean, uh, how how hard did you have to look to find a, like an actual team in Greece to like to play? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, I when I moved, I kind of figured that I wouldn't be able to play hockey anymore, but uh, I more or less stumbled upon it because I went. The my friends from school said that there is an ice rink open, and I thought it was just you know to go and skate, and there wasn't any hockey playing and i saw some pictures and some information sent sent an email and realized that they are playing like every friday i mean from like uh, yes september to april may june almost some years which is pretty cool based on the weather there so they are they are almost year round and uh, they 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 love the game and they are doing this for the love of the game in Greece, like, uh, w- what kind of influence do you really get out there, like, with, uh, you know, World Hockey? Is it more like uh, in, uh, uh, International Ice Hockey Federation, or do you get any, you know, NHL influence uh, out uh, when you were out in Greece? No, not really. That's, um, it's a bit sad because the, you need to live up to some of the international standards for IIHF in order to be able to like play internationally and some things like that so Greece are living up to all of them now in regards to number of players uh, referees uh, female players and so on but because they don't have enough uh, Olympic size rink they are not allowed to play any like international tournaments for uh, IIHF and I think the last one they played was in 2011 10 and since then they haven't really played at all internationally so i mean the guys that are playing there are some of them are most of them are greeks there are a few canadians and americans but uh, most of them are greeks that they were um, they were raised in either us or canada and started playing there and then they moved back in a later later age to greece and just kept playing there well, that's kind of cool they kind of br- uh, brought hockey back to the homeland huh yeah exactly so uh Greek Greek ice hockey actually started in 1984, just for that reason that it was uh, players that returned from Greece after have, uh, living abroad, and then the national team started in '92, and then they were playing up until yeah 20 I think 2011 or 2012, and then uh, now they're not allowed with the national team anymore, unfortunately. Oh uh, wow! Well, um, uh, so is there a lot of uh, NHL influence or um, maybe KHL influence? Just uh, I mean, do, uh, these guys that are playing, do they watch? Do they watch a lot of pro hockey, or is it more just they're uh, more um, focused on just playing? No, they uh, they are following NHL uh, a lot. Like uh, they all have their own teams, and uh, they're following that. Uh, every day so they they definitely just they they love to play but they also watch like all the games oh you gotta love it you gotta love it i mean um to be completely honest with you i uh, th- this is why i love the podcast because i get to find out you know where uh where hockey's popping up and uh, it's just it's beautiful to hear that you know the game is stretching even more so, yeah, Marcus, sure. who's the Wayne Gretzky of Greek hockey? <laughs> <laughs> the Greek one. The Greek one. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That, the Greek that's ski. a good question. Nice. <coughs> because, uh, yeah, I, I know these guys, and uh, I don't know if I want to <laughs> pick it. <laughs> but, uh, 
<laughs> but uh, I mean, the, the level is really mixed, like from uh, basic up to pretty good players. And uh, I mean, there are there is uh, one kid now that he's born in the early 2000s that he actually moved to Sweden uh, a year ago to pursue hockey more seriously here. So uh, he started, he, he's born and raised in uh, Greece and only been playing in Greece on the limited resources. And now he's moved to Sweden to try to play more serious. So that's pretty cool. I have a question about that. Is that a common path that you're trying to see the players take right now with the way that Greek hockey is developing? I can understand if maybe their influence is getting people into the sport and getting them involved in a youth program. But then if they show some kind of uh, promise that they need to go elsewhere, that's really not uncommon from how hockey in the United States started and became more competitive against the Canadians. The early Americans, once they got good enough, were going and living with families in Canada and playing on teams there. So is that kind of what's happening in Greece? I'm curious what's going on in that regard. Yeah, I wouldn't say so. Like, I think that uh, this guy is the first guy to, that I know of at least to, to move, like, for the sake of hockey. Um, it's... Um, most most players are that in uh, the adults are have more or less i guess they don't pursue a professional career they're playing now for fun it's more of a beer league thing i mean the there are some of the of the younger guys on the youth team that uh, they definitely have uh, aspirations to uh, become great and uh, then in order to do that i think they will have to move abroad at some point because there are just mm -hmm. two limited resources in Greece at the moment and they are not getting any funding. And uh, yeah, so they basically have to do everything themselves. So if they want to play on a higher level, they would definitely have to go abroad at some point. That makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Ross, you look like you got a question on your brain. Well, um, I'd also kind of like just from going from even, I guess I'll piggyback off of what Daniel asked with the with the. Uh, Greek Greek player going to Sweden. What is the difference, I guess, versus you know Swedish hockey to Greek hockey to playing hockey kind of in the states over here? Yeah, that's a good question. I have I haven't played hockey in the states, so I'm not uh, too familiar there. But I mean, in uh, Europe, we have uh, the larger the larger rinks, and since. Uh, in Greece, they had only half the size. So, and we were playing four on four because five on five is just too crowded on that rink. So, because of that, the hockey gets a bit, uh, a bit different, and uh, it's much more a start and stop more than, uh, yeah, mo skating around, uh, because uh, you take a few, a few skate strides and then you're offside. So, <laughs> it's a different type of play because of that. <coughs> Oh yeah, okay. there's no neutral zone rather than a you know wider neutral zone. So yeah, you take two strides, you're outside, eh? Exactly. <laughs> so in in that regard, yeah. So you, uh, it, down in Greece, there's not even a I mean a regular sized ice rinks then. Yeah, exactly. So they had uh, they had a few uh, back in the days, but uh, they have closed now, I guess, because of limited demand and uh, I mean they, they have a lot of uh, like uh, abandoned uh, stadiums from the 2004 Olympics that stands but uh, with the financial situation that they are in right now they're just no one willing to invest and especially not in a in ice hockey there since it's uh, such a small scale Oh, wow. That's yeah. A, yeah, I can I, understand that. I mean, especially growing the sport. We've, we've had a few guests on talking about how they're growing the sports in other countries, too, like Japan, as a result of trying, like, more as an anticipation of the Olympics rather than a residual effect of the Olympics, like in Greece. But the Olympic Committee also does impact studies and looks at the effect of the mm -hmm. footprint going in during and out of these games. And it's sometimes hit or miss. It really yeah. is. Yeah. And I can imagine in a country like Greece that, I mean, this is where the Olympics were born for Pete's sake. I'm not sure ice hockey's high on their priorities of sports to first go to as a cultural country, uh, especially with how much they love football slash soccer over there. 
So it's a different challenge compared to other cultures like where Australia, for example, those people are super athletic, but their culture is also, we want to try everything yeah. versus right. we want to do soccer and maybe some other sports at, and then maybe look at these things. Yeah. Cause you see them doing rugby, Australian football, um, right. you know, field hockey, cricket. I mean, you're right, Daniel, they've got their fingers and hands basically everywhere in the sports world it and seems like that's fine because greece is a athletic culture which is great yeah. uh it but i i i guess it's quite challenging especially if you're taking a rink splitting it in half and then going the opposite way north south with two teams on it and things like that it's a different game completely yeah mm-hmm. Definitely. And just a quick question just about on the ice and comparing the NHL to Swedish hockey. You look at the Sundines and they, their playmaking ability, I think, having a bigger uh, sheet of ice um, definitely you know, corresponds with having more playmaking ability, finding more players in open ice, and just kind of having more of a, an open ice game. Compared to NHL, you are stuck along, along the boards a lot. So I think just kind of making that comparison compared to Swedish hockey with NHL too as well is just a point I wanted to make there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I actually do want to take it back to Swedish hockey, obviously. Um, I mean, you're a huge Sundin fan. Uh, who, el- who else has really like uh, uh, influenced you throughout? The- I mean, uh, you said Sundin and Forsberg. Who, who, like, I mean, there's so many incredible Swedish players to really go through. Like, who, who else has really influenced you and just, you know, uh, to further you through the love of the game? Yeah, wow, there there's so many, but I mean in in that generation when when uh, when I started playing it was uh, it was Mats Sundin, it was Peter Forsberg, it was the uh, Sedin brothers, it was uh, uh Sederberg, like uh, I mean uh, most of Detroit was uh, Swedish players at that time. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh yeah, so these guys so so many uh, so many people and now we're in a generation shift and uh, I think uh, we have I mean around 130 Swedish players last year in the NHL. Oh yeah. And, uh, some of them, some of them, I mean, is, uh, I mean, Elias Pedersen and uh, Rasmus Dahlin that uh, they're coming up and they are instantly taking a, a spot in the, in the team. So that's pretty cool. And it, uh, I think it speaks uh, volume also for Swedish ice hockey, which uh, I mean, is pretty cool and makes me proud. Absolutely. I mean, you, you see, you see, like you know, under seventeen and uh, uh, you know, uh, under twenty teams, like Swedish teams, really uh, almost taking a step almost every year. Um, uh, what uh, what else I want to know is, uh, you know, obviously you've got the you know Swedish hockey league over there. I heard you're a bit of a Fro, uh, Frolunda uh, fan. Is that correct? Yeah. That uh, I must say, I'm, uh, I've lived in Gothenburg here all my life, and then uh, there is only one uh, one option for the team. <laughs> so uh, there is definitely for all now that is uh, closest to my heart, and uh, uh, it's been really good lately. We have been uh, doing well in the Swedish league as well as in the um, CHL, which is the Champions Hockey League, which is basically all European teams except for the Russians that they compete every year, and uh, for is doing doing very well also there so um i gotta i gotta i gotta ask um you know in uh you know in the states and in canada we have these like huge you know sports arenas and uh with the, it'll fit like god knows how many what you know like eighteen thousand. if, if easy. so oh, yeah. Um, yeah easy um, th- in in sweden is is it like that as well <clears throat> you know you've got these uh your hockey teams and uh just uh, can you explain what you know uh games are like and you know uh, how many people show up and you know what the, what the atmosphere is all about yeah, definitely. So, uh, Frölunda is actually the team that has the highest uh, attendance. They, uh, if they fill the stadium, it's uh, twelve thousand, and uh, usually it's around ten or eleven. Uh, most teams are between, I would say, like six and eight thousand, which is not a bad thing because usually these uh, arenas are built for hockey and they make them more. They make them smaller and more compact, so the atmosphere in the arenas are usually much better in the smaller arenas than in the big ones. I mean, Frölunda's uh, 
home arena Scandinavium is uh, actually more built for concerts and it's not optimal to create like great hockey atmosphere gotcha so um, yeah to answer your question it's uh, the atmos the atmosphere is good like uh, I have I haven't been I've been in the States last time 15 years ago and went to a game uh, New York Rangers and uh, I mean that was just amazing and we will we will never get that amount of people in the in the stadium but uh, the atmosphere is good and it's just the the stadiums needs to be the ones that they are built for it really creates great atmosphere yeah because um i remember the the avalanche uh playing uh the oh, Ottawa yeah. senators in uh stockholm and uh they they played at uh the Ericsson globe right is, is it, and um it's it seemed bigger than that is is the globe uh mainly built for just like concerts like you said or is, because I know, I know Stockholm has a team. Uh, they they do they not play there, or um, is it is it a, a, it's a, a multi-use? Yeah, so Ericsson Globe is multi-use, and uh, they they use it sometimes for hockey, mostly for international games, uh, because uh, I th- I'm not exactly sure if they take fifteen or eighteen something thousand, but. The, the team that's playing now in the SHL uh, Jurgården will just not attract that type of, uh, of an audience. And they are playing in Hovet, which is uh, the arena right next to it, which is uh. my point before that, uh, I mean, they have, they have a great crowd that makes a lot of noise. And when they are in a more compact arena, it, uh, it creates a great atmosphere. And I think that it will not be that good if they're playing in the globe. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Well, and that kind of reminds me of like the Winnipeg Jets because they have, I think, the smallest attending attendance people that can attend in their arena out of all the NHL teams. Yeah. But I mean, it, it's hard to go in there and play because they get loud. Yeah. And only having fifteen thousand people in that compact of an area, I could see where that would just kind of be a little bit more electrifying. So. And you, you, honestly, I I'd, I'd almost ra- I'd much rather actually have a smaller place with a with a louder uh, sounding crowd. I yeah. think. Um, I mean, uh, unfortunately, here you know in, uh, in Denver, uh, the ball arena. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's so big and it doesn't fill up at nearly as much as it should. And yeah. um, the only time it gets like really like earth thundering loud is during the playoffs you know and um you know when when you walk into uh, a stadium that's super loud and like just going all out uh, all out for the uh home team you know it it really um invigorates like a sense of pride in mm-hmm. you and you know and and unfortunately you know in a lot of these big bigger arenas the sound doesn't you know uh, echo so much so you you kind of feel like oh my god dude like do we have any p- fans right totally and yet marcus i have a question here just talking about atmosphere do you guys treat these games at these arenas kind of like europeans do with soccer is do people sta- sit the entire time are they standing up are they chanting the entire time just kind of tell me about the atmosphere and what's going on during the games yeah, so most uh, most arenas are built uh, with uh, with seats, and uh, except for the um, how do you call it on the short side uh, of the stadium, that's usually standing, and that's where most of the noise comes from. That uh, <laughs> they're chanting for the home team and so on. But uh, I would say that the majority of the of the audience is uh, sitting down for most of the most of the games. No, you got like uh, I I gotta I gotta know like you guys got like fan addicts like <laughs> just people who just go insane during the entire game, eh? Yeah, of course. I mean, there are uh, there, <laughs> there are different type of characters in these games, and uh, some some are louder, and uh, some are there like uh, business events that they go with the with the office, and maybe these people don't make so much noise, but. Uh, <laughs> And they are, they are usually the ones sitting down, but the people that are are there to support their team, they usually they usually show it. 
Yeah, so not, not too different from, you know, over here. Um, no. uh, a lot of body painting. Any any body <laughs> painting. We, we we get the uh we get the occasional body painter and we're like, yeah, I always look at that guy like dude, you must be fucking insane. You know, you know you're hanging out in an ice rink for about three hours, right? <laughs> Do I don't you? think those people really think too far ahead. No, I pretty, no. Well, yeah, or think at all, maybe. That's. Well, <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're about like uh, five or six beers in, so they're not thinking about much, anyways. <laughs> the caked paint will keep me warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Marcus, I wanted to ask you uh, a business question as well, because I know with business and sports management, maybe you have some insight here, because you've mentioned like the size of arenas as well. I'm kind of thinking. That's intentional also just because when you have five or 6,000, chances are the only people that are going to be able to get tickets are the locals because that's how much interest. And then it keeps the uh, rival teams out of the arenas a little bit. But also from like a promotional standpoint, you know that the sponsors that you bring into the arena have a higher likelihood of making an impact with that crowd because they can actually invest in those businesses backed by their advertising making relevant sense to them and such any th- insight there yeah sorry i interrupted you oh you're fine oh. yeah definitely so uh they they don't uh, keep away the away team's um, uh, supporters like usually the away team is uh, promised a certain amount of seats if they want to they don't have to and then they can sell them to others but they have a time frame that uh, you get uh, 500 uh, or so tickets that uh, they can first the away uh, spectators can buy and then uh, then that gets released to everyone whoever wants to but definitely to your point that uh, that, it, uh, that there is of course a majority will be from the the home supporters and uh, that's uh, then it's easier for sponsors to direct their i mean sponsorships and see who they want to attract they know who they will attract in the stadiums so so speaking of sports management let's get into that a little bit let's um let's kind of take this uh uh conversation that way uh, so the big, the big thing that I've, I've been wondering, especially lately, you know, with uh, like, you know, obviously the COVID outbreak and everything, um, from you know, from from that kind of point of view, uh, what do you think these, um, these teams and you know, uh, GMs and stuff are, are you know, looking to maybe kind of quell this, well, a uh, money loss and b to get back on track. Like, uh, what, what do you th- uh, from? From your uh, from your point of view, where where does that begin, and where do you think we're going to end on that? Yeah, so when this whole COVID thing started in the early spring, we I think that most teams thought that they were pretty lucky because we missed out on the playoffs. But uh, we thought that uh, the summer is going to come, and uh, when the fall comes, uh, everything will be over. Now, when this is not a f- uh, the case. I think that uh, most uh, GMs and clubs in general are worried. Uh, Many of them have taken measures. Some teams, the players have agreed to go down uh, on salaries. Other teams have, uh, they are um, having different like GoFundMe campaigns. We have uh, in Sweden uh, something that's called Swish that you can very easily send money over your phone. Uh, to the team so they they ask for they call it like couch tickets because uh, okay. the, the games are still televised but uh, you cannot go to the game so it, this, they ask the supporters like please donate uh, whatever amount of money you can so I mean they're taking every measure to I mean minimize the losses but uh, this is really tough on them and uh, if this continues in the long run I don't know how long some teams will be able to survive this to be honest yeah, true. Because I mean, a lot a lot of teams they they don't uh, they don't get the same amount of funding as like maybe a, a more popular or uh, a team that's located in more uh, populated uh, part. You know, so um, in 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 that regard, uh, what uh, what kind of steps do you, uh, other than like getting donations do you think uh, they they should maybe start taking, or do you think uh, do you think they'll just have to go bankrupt? At, uh, as the situation in Sweden is right now, we the hockey has got um, 
uh, money from the state and uh, that's I guess and has been distributed around the, the hockey scene mostly on the pro level and I mean that has been very important for the team survival. Otherwise I mean uh, it's difficult to look ahead for the teams when it comes to uh, I mean recruiting players for the upcoming years like how much money can you spend and uh, which type of players can you look for and maybe you need to I mean some contracts that are expiring you cannot promise them anything maybe you need to take up some juniors to i mean make some money on mm. the budget so i mean they i guess they are uh, the gms have uh, getting gray hairs here they need to find like different different paths on how to work this out and i mean i don't think anyone has the answer so uh, they, they're doing what they can uh, this is a truly unprecedented uh, situation. So, I mean, uh, I, from what I've seen, I mean, from the NHL, they've they've been doing a pretty pretty okay job of, I mean, well, at least for the playoffs and all that. But uh, this, I mean, a whole new season. That's a that's a whole another story. So, are they uh, are teams still like traveling uh, from city to city and stuff, or are they trying to? Are they? Um, in a bubble, or are they considering looking at like a bit, of, like a bit of a bubble in, you know, um, specified places or anything like that? I haven't heard anything about the bubble. As uh, the season is right now, it's uh, going on uh, as usual. Some games have been delayed when some teams have gotten uh, cases of COVID. Then they postpone them. They isolate these players and. Uh, they test everyone and then when they feel like the situation is safe they are continuing the schedule so some games have been postponed but also as of right now it's they try to continue as normal there there are games going on right now as we speak how uh about how many uh cases do you think uh well have have been discovered in uh the SHL so far ooh tough question um I, I don't have the numbers, but uh, the, the, there are a handful of players in uh, many of the teams, the majority of the teams that have, that have gotten infected. The, the captain of Frölunda, Joel Lundqvist, uh, brother of Henrik Lundqvist, um, had it a few weeks back, but he's back playing now. So uh, some play, they just, I mean, they need, so I, they need to isolate them. They need to get better and uh, wait it out more or less. And then they are back to play. So. I mean, yeah, basically like a injured reserve. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, it's so challenging. I I'm starting to understand why some people early in the hockey season, when it was postponed and then it came back, would say this is going to be the hardest Stanley Cup to win. And I'm a sports fan, and it's kind of embarrassing to look through all of the news and it's either this one thing happened today or here's 18 other stories about who and what league got COVID and why it's happening and being postponed. And right. it's like, Oh boy. Uh, and with Sweden's situation, um, your own league, smaller country, do a little bit more traveling on the road. Um, that's interesting. Then also, I think if you wanted to try to keep the league going, you would want to attract more players. Perhaps it starts becoming a situation of what pro player is available and what country is doing the best job of protecting their athletes to um, give that person a good chance of playing. Because there's a lot of people that are fringe players in all of these leagues and might be looking for a contract from the NHL now over in Europe and think like, you know, it's healthier over there. And in the NHL, they're talking about an all-Canadian bubble because they don't see the confidence in the United States to allow the traveling. Mm -hmm. So they want to close that border situation. So it's interesting how there's a financial aspect to this. There's also a country, um, I guess, health protocol situation going on that then trickles down and affects clubs and their abilities to travel and, and things like that. So it's unprecedented. It's incredibly challenging. And for these smaller leagues that people love, I'm really happy to hear that Sweden is doing things um, like selling couch tickets and the fans are behind that. But, you know, those fans need money from their economy, which is also suffering because of COVID. So it's all very related and it's um, just 
uh, interesting. I'm just making a comment that these athletes and athletic leagues that we love and think are kind of always going to run and no problems, you know, not so much. Yeah, that's a very good point. Anything from the peanut gallery? Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just listening to you guys and just putting little notes and anecdotes out there. Um, I'm also seeing that you kind of uh, but have bumped shoulders with some of the guys uh, with Bauer oh, as yeah, well. That's, uh, um, yeah. So, um, I mean, at, does, do they help out with, uh, I guess, with any of the teams with their equipment that you, are, uh, you go see or that are up there in Sweden? Or do you see, you know, big-name players get to bump shoulders or rub elbows with those guys as well, I guess? Uh, sorry, your question was what the bar is doing for the hockey in Sweden. Yeah, well, it, w- what they were doing for hockey in Sweden up there, and like, what is kind of like your relation with them out with Bauer as well? Yeah, so uh, I'm actually an employee of Bauer. I'm working in the customer service uh, department since two years. Nice. So we have the the. We are basically split into two. We're having Bauer for North America, and then and uh, then we have Bauer for the rest of the world, as we call it, which is uh, basically Asia and and uh, Europe and uh, also Australia and yeah, ev- every other country more or less, except for North America. So uh, yeah, so I'm working there, and uh, I mean Bauer has really taken like they 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 really want to help, and I mean. I have, I've heard you guys talk before that like about the hockey community and everyone comes together and I mean Bauer is part of this hockey family and they have several initiatives they, that they start and they have the game is a gift and the Bauer gives back which goes every year that the, they want to give back to people in the community uh, in the hockey community mostly people that uh, had it difficult and I mean this year obviously the the theme is uh, p- people who've been affected by the the COVID. And uh, this year also we made um, the hockey equipment relief program that uh, we made uh, donations of uh, two million dollars worth of hockey equipment. Wow. To, wow. Uh, oh my. So, I mean, Bauer is doing what they can. We are, and I, I guess you've also seen our like face masks and face shields. And I mean, right when this COVID thing happened, we switched uh, to pro- from producing our hockey products to a face max and face shield that we distribute mm-hmm. to hospitals and uh, first responders. So yeah, I'm I'm really proud to say that uh, I work for Bauer because I really feel like they are doing a difference in the hockey community and uh, uh, our uh, yeah the, our marketing uh, president there is Mary Kay Messier and uh, her brother was. Uh, pretty good hockey player also. I don't want to I, <laughs> I don't know who you're talking she's about doing with, uh, she's doing great work with all of these uh, initiatives and uh, yeah I I did not know that the uh, Mary Kay Messier was a part of Bauer. That's actually pretty cool. So uh, um, so she does with the uh, international uh, uh, Bauer she's the VP of marketing so globally but uh, oh wow. We, wow I mean we have marketing department also in Sweden, but she's the yeah she's uh, heading up our marketing department. Uh, and then to get back to what you said, and I know we covered this on the podcast with Bauer just dropping everything and being like one of the first companies just to just say, hey, we're stopping all production and we're gonna help out not only our you know our hockey community but also reach out and just kind of spread our wings into helping the actual community which i thought was really awesome of them to do that's awesome over two million dollars in donations that's really significant and really awesome um marcus i was just curious because you are a customer um service representative for bauer what um what is something some of the things that bauer is doing in terms of equipment to make things safer for the players especially when it comes to um head injuries things like that yeah, so uh, for uh, you want to talk about like uh, head head injuries uh, specifically, we are. I mean, 
I, we believe that we are the market leaders, that uh, we are best in the game, and uh, we are spending like a lot of money into development bo for all our products. And definitely, I mean, concussion has been a big thing the last couple of years. And uh, we are, I mean, we are developing our, our helmets to have more of, um, I mean, to be able to take more impact. And that's uh, just an ongoing thing. We will never be satisfied. Uh, we will continue to develop, but that's uh, now what we have in our helmets is that uh, the interior of the helmet is uh, moving slightly. So if you're getting a hit from an angle, the helmet will move with you slightly in order to uh, make the impact less serious on your head. With that said, it's very important to say that, I mean, if you're getting uh, a check in full speed to your head, there is not a helmet in the world that will be 100% guarantee you from a from a concussion, but we're doing everything we can in order to, I mean, create the best product possible that will make it as safe as possible. And also, if we are talking about, I mean, COVID now, and we have developed what we call splash guards, which is a guard that, uh, that you put, if you have a full visor, you're putting it on the lower part of your visor now right. in order to be more, to protect from COVID. And uh, so you can play with that to be more safe. That's awesome. So you're kind of protecting everybody from physical injury and also this biological warfare we have going on right now, too, as well. So that's really interesting. Thanks for elaborating on that. Biological warfare. <laughs> that's a, probably the best way to describe COVID uh, right now, honestly. So I got to ask, I, I mean, how often do you get to try out all the gear, man? Do you, you, know, do you get yeah. to, uh, do you, get a, do, you know, just uh, one day at work, you know, just go out to the rink and uh, test out some uh, power sticks? Check out this stays. new stick with all the speed holes in it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Watch me flex it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that made the, the Nexus uh, stick there with a the hole in the blade. That was a, that was a big thing. But, yeah. uh, to, to answer your question, we are we are having uh, in Sweden we are having hockey every Friday. We are playing an hour before work. Oh, cool! And, I mean, if 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 there is a new product, uh, we'll might try it out, see how it is. So, uh, for me in the customer service, when I will talk about it to the customers, I need to be able to, I mean, say what how great it is. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're like, you know, uh, 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 you, you ever just like say, oh well, I wouldn't have bought that one. I, I, I most definitely would have just bought this one instead. Yeah, exactly. So that's, uh, yeah, but of course that happens. That's so awesome. I'd love to like see some of these pickup games going on, and then all of a sudden someone like gets the puck in in zero to. Uh, two seconds they like turn on the rocket skate and it like flies them oh, on a breakaway geez. to the other end of the <laughs> rink or it's like why is the ambulance here oh it's because i guess that goalie mask that we made doesn't make you vulnerable from hockey slap shots <laughs> right go, like, go get goalie yeah exactly i just love the idea that you're in a fight and you push a button and your glove like flies off and hits the person nuke <laughs> from bauer <laughs> maybe one day in like 31 52 that, yeah. that's that's where hockey's heading <laughs> oh man that's that's awesome uh so uh, so uh, i mean hockey day every friday that's that's incredible so that's just like a uh, that's just a thing where all all, all the guy all the every uh, everybody at work um just uh, goes and plays puck before uh uh for the work day starts yeah exactly so uh it's uh i mean every bauer employee in sweden that they want to and we are also bringing along some friends so we can feel to have i mean two two teams and we're uh, just uh skating yeah skating an hour before work so that's uh, just a great great start on a friday i should say so yeah. man uh you know i used to work for hobby lobby and i never got to play hockey before <laughs> an hour before work like <laughs> i'd like to think this started mondays before work but then there was too much beef that how lasted during the week so they switched it to fridays to allow people to cool off on the weekends <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you turned in that TPS report without signing it. Just a nice bunch of, you know, hacks to the legs, you know. Yeah, so it's just, it's it's really great to hear that, you know, Bauer's, uh, Bauer's willing to, you know, help out, help out the community. And not only that, but, I mean, have a real fun day on Fridays for, for you know, their employees. I think that's just, uh, 
that's a great thing to do and i, I you know I don't, you don't hear much about that like going on you know within the world at least not in my in my social circle circles <laughs> No, what a wonderful work atmosphere to be in. Yeah, well, remember when James Crosby was on the show and he was talking about how for the Bay Area, for, like, new nerds that they'd get for the tech companies, they'd try to recruit them from Canada and tell them, like, oh, our hockey team is better than their hockey team. Oh, yeah. yeah. So it is funny how, like, that kind of stuff does, like, kind of sway people one way or the other. So I'd like to think that there's someone, like, standing outside the two building doors of Bauer or CCM in Sweden and someone at Bauer's like, but we play hockey every Friday. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, uh, do you actually uh, get to play against, like, you know, different um, different sporting oh, companies like question. CCM? Do you, uh, do you guys ever have, like, a little, like, little tournament or anything like that? So I've only been with the company two years, but uh, what I've been told is that they, there used to be games uh, against uh, CCM, but uh, those tended to be... Uh, to be how do you say the heat was high and uh, <laughs> oh, so we got just got all our brawls between the Bauer and Every, CCM guys everybody's just Donnie Brook and the hell out of oh, each yeah. other <laughs> Hanson's everywhere you know honestly that... I like the idea that they're fighting and one jersey comes over and it's like should have put a fight strap in it buddy <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, honestly, that's the best answer I think I could have gotten right there. Like, honestly, they just get too heated, so it just doesn't I love it. It's anymore. like, yeah, we're a perfect community. Everyone's really... No, never mind. Except when we play the... CCM, it's all yeah. on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're all good and fine, except for those CCM guys. <laughs> Your skates suck ass. <laughs> well, fuck you, man. I, I just... Sorry we can't all have Bauer Vapor. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, th- that's awesome! Though, I, like I said, like there's th- that was the best answer I could have gotten. Uh, to be completely honest with you, well, uh, that's pretty good. Before we uh, before we sign off here, man, uh, can uh, well obviously you know can, uh, talk, tell us about your podcast. Yeah. I mean, um, I've been listening to uh, the last uh, the last four. I haven't uh, heard the um, uh, the last one, uh, Posvinska. But um, yes. uh, but uh, I mean uh, I mean with uh, Andre Schlashen that was that was an incredible episode. Uh, yeah, just to, uh, give us you know the rundown about uh, sports management podcast and uh, you know uh, tell us why you got into it and uh, what what you like about it. Yeah, so uh, I've uh, wanted to do a podcast for a long time and uh, always had this idea that uh, there should be a sports management podcast there. To my knowledge, at least I haven't seen one before. There might be one out there, but I haven't found one. And I felt like there should be one. And I just never like got myself to do it. And now with the COVID and uh, you're, you're stuck in the house and you, you, you find yourself with more time, I just decided it was time to, to start it. And uh, so in the, in the spring this year, I started with the preparations and started recording episodes starting from the summer. And uh, yeah, so I'm just reaching out to to professionals from the sports management industry. As you said, I talked to Anders Larsson, which is the president of the Swedish Ice Hockey Federation. Uh, I was in Greece talking to the uh, CEO of the Athens Marathon, which was great. Um, oh yeah, Doctor Doctor Asimakopoulos was also he was the uh, sports director for the uh, 2004 Olympics. I mean, this guy has just a ton of experience and knowledge to share. Wow, that was, that was amazing. And I'm just trying to find uh, interesting people from I mean different sports. I've had hockey, a marathon, um, American football, and uh, floorball, and I'm yeah. I, I'm trying to find interesting people in the industry from different sports. And uh, yeah, that's where I'm going. I've five episodes now as you mentioned the fifth one was in swedish so uh it was a bonus episode oh yeah uh, oh but, yeah uh, nice uh, yeah otherwise uh, i mean they're in english they're for everyone to listen to and they can be found where i mean any podcast directory so if you're into sports management definitely have a listen 
No, absolutely. And um, so, uh, you know, you know, you, you, you just started out and uh, I mean, we uh, we're on a podcast right now. We've all had our ups and downs. What do you think? Uh, what do you think the best part about your uh, uh, doing the podcast is? Besides talking to us right now. Yeah. Well, yeah obviously. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely the highlight. Oh, well, hey. <laughs> There's, as I said in the beginning, I mean, you had some incredible guests uh, before me here, and don't know if I can fill those shoes, but I'm doing my best here. Uh, but, uh, 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 no, but you can right fill here. our inboxes with skates because you oh, work oh, at Bauer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> free equipment would be awesome, Marcus. I'm, uh, I'm size 11, you know. Uh, well, I, they'll never get used, but I mean, I can wear them in, on, uh, while I'm sitting in my wheelchair. That'd be awesome. We're 60, <laughs> thanks. I'm yeah, I'm a 70. <laughs> no, uh, no, but seriously, Marcus, like, I. I really appreciate the sports management side that you're bringing to the podcast realm. And I think it's important. And I'm curious, what are some of the topics that you really like to talk about within the sports management world? Cause I could see things like, uh, what we've been saying about the business side of how you function a league or how you run a team or what you do in the relegation world of sport versus the non relegation worlds in North America. So, any insights into what you've been talking about or what you like to talk about? Yeah, so definitely. And uh, I mean, the, the, sports, the sports business is uh, not new, but it has, I mean, it has uh, spiked lately, like, in my opinion. And there are, like, now every team is more or less uh, the business of their own. And uh, I mean, I like to talk about the. I have. I want it also to be educational for people who want to get into the industry, and I'm uh, mm. I'm asking these people with a ton of experience how did they get into the industry? What, uh, how important is education? How, like, networking? What what should young people do to get into the industry? This is something that I find very interesting, and uh, then also how it is to to work in sports and uh, how does it differ from working in. I mean, most people that I've talked to have worked also in other industries. So you just compare mm -hmm. that, how it is to work for within sports versus a non-sport organization or company. And I mean, the these people that when you work in sports, usually you love sports and mm -hmm. they, they express that they feel lucky that they are able to work with what they love. And I think that that's just great to the sports management that you can actually have your your hobby as a um, that's your job. Oh, great. Absolutely. I mean, all of us have been, you know, we, we've, we've all play, grown up playing sports. Uh, I mean, obviously have a, a gigantic love for it. And that's, and I mean, uh, m the management side is not a, uh, what a lot of these, a lot of people think about No, when you think about sports, but yes, yes, there is a huge, there's a huge demand for it and i mean obviously need for it as well so it's a really good uh, perspective to look at it in, in, in the very end is that like yeah we need these people to keep our our beloved sports alive so it's it, it, i find it really interesting to actually really listen listen to what all these you know seasoned veteran sports management uh higher ups can you know really get, that actually really do and give back to the actual sports itself i i, I want to that yeah and i i, I want to add to what you're saying cody because i think what ends up happening too is um, you go through this, like Marcus was saying, most people in it are um, fans of sport. And I grew up wanting to be a professional athlete. And now I spend my time talking about sport and wishing that was my profession because I'd clearly like to be doing this. We're swimming in cash over here and on the bench with Beats, oh, by yeah. the way. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Totally. But, I've, got uh, my, I've got my Lamborghini coming yeah. there, Dano. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, well, I mean, who doesn't? But <laughs> it's, it's really good to have a voice or a place to look out for advice because even ourselves, we're looking for that place. We, we want to grow. We want to keep bringing you guys good episodes and things like that. So there's a lot of insight out there that I'm looking forward to listening from you and your podcast about. So 
Totally, especially, you know, when you're a young sports fan, you just see these guys on TV doing their thing. And as you get older, you realize there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes to make this all happen, make it all work oh, in yeah. the first place. So, And yeah. you guys are the one that's making it happen. You know, you guys are the one that's wheeling, dealing, you know, uh, uh, and honestly, just like I said, without you guys, you know, we we wouldn't have you know uh these reverse retro jerseys or right. um you know promotions uh you know getting you know buy one get one tickets or anything like that or even a, a place to play mm-hmm. so uh and i mean getting the uh, players that we love so dearly you know mm-hmm. so i mean in the, in that in that regard i mean yeah you guys really do uh, make everything behind the scenes happen yep so I mean, and, and you know, when you're a kid, you know, nobody says, oh, "I want to grow up to be a general manager," you know. But uh, when you get older, you do start to realize that those guys are re- like some of the real heroes here. Oh, and you you think they're they don't I guess have that much smarts about it, but then once again, as you guys have said that there's so much that goes into it with the salary cap, like, and just getting everything just running like a well-oiled machine making in that fans aspect. happy it's yeah. huge it's it's a it's a big job and i i gotta say big ups <laughs> to that i i just i i that's yep. that's really all i can say so i'll tell you what Mar- marcus i think this was an incredible uh uh, incredible little episode man thank you so much for coming on man uh do you uh do you have uh anything you want to plug like uh just throw down some uh social media or anything like that i know i'm uh, um i'm already throwing some stuff down but uh just maybe to reiterate yeah so if uh as i said before the podcast can be found on all the major podcast directories it's a sports management podcast and on uh, social media it's a sports m podcast and it's on yep. facebook instagram and twitter okay yeah and you can always um i mean you can always catch out our stories we're, we're uh pretty much anytime a new episode's out it's on our uh instagram and facebook stories so yeah check out marcus phillips and sports management podcast um do uh you want to shout out to anybody out in uh sweden or anything uh, yeah just uh go back to what we talked a little bit in the beginning of the episode just with greek hockey that uh, i mean they they really have the passion for the sport and they uh, they just don't have the funding and but they're doing like they're doing amazing there if anyone is interested uh, they can go to icehockey.gr and then uh, they have all like you can read up on some history you can uh, yeah re- learn a little bit more about uh, greek ice hockey nice absolutely yeah, yeah that's awesome man um all right let's start with shout outs bryce what do you got uh who you, who you got uh the usual is uh, of course shout out to marcus thanks for being here um and friends family uh my beer nation dog nation and our listeners daniel yeah i'm gonna give a shout out to kim ning she is the first uh female general manager in what is regarded as all of the professional sports in north america she was named the new head gm of the miami marlins that's wow. huge that is huge fantastic yeah so i want to give her a big shout out she's been in baseball for over 30 years she has some history working with Derek jeter as an assist when she was assistant gm with the yankees this woman has been around for a long time i'm really really proud of her i know she's really proud of where she is right now and just on the theme of sports management and general managers, I thought that would be a good shout out. So I'm fantastic, yeah. And yeah, I That's guess awesome. it'd be my friends, family, fans. Uh, yeah, as we said, Dog Nation, My Beer Nation, all that good fun stuff. Uh, Marcus, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you uh, giving us the time of day uh, to talk some uh, sports management with us. Uh, this is yeah, actually thank kind you so of- much for having me on. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. This is kind of funny that you mentioned uh, Ning. Um, I want to send this out shout out to Tanya Moreno for uh, becoming the senior vice president of marketing for the Arizona Arizona Coyotes. Nice. Yeah. There you go. There and you go. also, um, obviously, Marcus, thank you so much for all the work that you're doing for us. 
And um, uh, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna rip this out real quick. Talk so Mike for the do at Talameos. That's great. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, w- uh, without further ado, um, thank you, Marcus. Uh, Vihosh. Salut. A bientôt. A bientôt. <laughs> All right. See you guys later. Bye. Bye.